This morning, I wanted to pick up in a series, a new series called The Last Days. And uh, the reason for that is people have been asking me, asking me, you know, given all the things that we're seeing at this point in time, the locust swarms right through uh, Central East Africa that's going on. You know, people, have you noticed how quickly people get offended these days? Because the scripture says in these last days, people will get offended quickly and betray one another quickly. They'll betray one another. And then I don't know if you've noticed the increased earthquakes and the volcanoes, even in the Pacific this last week, uh, where tsunamis followed and hit Tonga. And you, you see the pandemics like COVID-19 that we've experienced in the last two years and more to come. We see the situation of war looming with uh, Russia on the border of Ukraine and wars around the world, rumors of wars, even wars that are rumors of wars. Then we see the uptick of lawlessness and, and crime. We see good being called evil and evil being called good. We see the love of God in many who follow Christ starting to wane and their love of sin growing greater than the love of God. And as you see this, many people are asking, Kevin, is this the last days? And if this is the last days, how's it all going to go down? And what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to prepare ourselves? What about the mark of the beast? What about the mark of the beast that will be put on the right hand or the forehead? Who is the Antichrist? And a lot of people are spending hundreds of hours studying the Antichrist. Who is the, what is the Antichrist spirit? What does the scripture say will happen? You see, as we study last days or end times, Jesus never used the word end times, he used the word last days. It's, it's called eschatology. Uh, can you tell your neighbor eschatology? <laughs> That's the study of the last days. And as we look at that, I wanted to just show, share with you the main scriptures people use is Mark 13. And today we're going to go through Mark 13 from verse 1 to verse 13 and next week from verse 14 to the end. And then there's Matthew 24, there's Luke 21, and then there's the book of Jude, 2 Thessalonians and Revelation. There's a lot in the scripture about end times. There's also Daniel 7. There's tons of scriptures in the Old Testament. Today, I wanted to just cover the last days and how to rest in Jesus. Later, we'll go into in the other sermons, the trumpets, the seals, and the bowls. Next week's title is called The Antichrist Spirit. And the week after that is The End and the Beginning. Tell your neighbor, the end and the beginning. Yeah. Not the beginning and the end, but the end and the beginning. But for today, I'm going to focus on Mark 13. So if you've got your Bibles, it's going to be heavy on Scripture. I apologize, but this requires a lot of study for us to go through. So Mark 13, verse 1 to 13 is where we're going to be, and I'm going to be bouncing around. But we start with the question, are we in the last days? Are we in the last days? Here's my answer. Yes, but... Tell your neighbor, yes, but. Yes, but. Yes, but. And there is a but. And I want to come back to the but. Because before I go on, let me ask you the question as a pastor. If I say, yes, it's the last days, what, what's the emotion that's evoked? What's the feeling that's evoked? Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Do you feel like dreams are crushed? Hopes are smashed? What comes to your mind how much time do I have left? So question, do you have a feeling of anxiety and fear or do you have a feeling of expectant joy? Which one do you have? If you have a response, and I'm speaking as a pastor, if you have a response of fear, then I have to ask you, what's your focus on? You see, I say yes, but because Whilst it's the last days and end times, I really don't know if the end times last, the last of the last days or the end of the end, I don't know if it's in three and a half years time or 10 years time 
or 20 years time or 50 years time? Because this is what Jesus said. His words, we need to study his words, not theologians' words, but Jesus' words. Look at Mark 13, verse 32, as I bumped down there. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven, or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. And since you don't know when that time will be, simply be on guard, be alert, stay alert and pray. Tell your neighbor, stay alert. Uh, don't pinch them this morning, just, just stay alert. Stay alert. So here's the first thing about knowing about last days. I'm gonna give you five points that we can overcome in these last days. First thing is this, fear not. Do you hear the word of God that came in the prophecy? Fear not, focus on Jesus. Fear not, focus on Jesus. Jesus himself tells us that we are in the last days when he walked on earth fully man, fully God, in this time he said, as Jesus the Messiah he said, these are the last days. Those were his words. He also said, no one knows the last days. So if anyone is telling you the end times, the end of end times is coming in three years or coming in seven years or coming in 10 years, they are deceived because Jesus said, no one knows. Now, the problem is many of us have been influenced by movies and books that we see. So when we think of last days and end times, maybe you, you've uh, remembered the Maya calendar, which uh, predicted that the end of the world ended on December 21st, 2012. And, and so therefore films were made like this one. I don't know if you ever saw this film, this film here, 2012, where it's the Maya civilization depicting the flood. The problem with the scripture, with this, this picture, is God promised us that there would never be a flood like the days of Noah again. Can you say amen with me? Amen. Or this one, this series called The Day After. And so our impression of last days and end times is often apocalyptical. But the problem is the word apocalypse actually doesn't mean destruction. Yet if I say apocalyptical, you might think destruction, you might think crashing planes, you might think volcanoes, you might think, but you know the word apocalyptical actually means revelation. The word revelation comes from the Greek apocalypse, which means the revealing of things that are happening in the divine heavenly places, revealing what God is doing. It isn't the revealing of what Satan's doing, it's a revealing of what Jesus Christ is doing. You know, the problem with many of us is that we've got caught up with uh, focusing on dates like uh, this one guy, Harold Camping, he, he taught uh, in 2011 that um, May 21st, again, he said May 21st, 2011, as a Christian, he taught that uh, the world was coming to an end. And so the whole church sold their houses and gave their cars and houses away and they moved up onto the top of a hill and hid in the wilderness and many of them dug holes and stashed food, canned food, and they hid across there because they thought it was coming to the world, end of the world. Well, 2015 has passed, we're still here. No one knows the end times, the exact end of end times. I've learned something in the last 23 years of ministry, this, life is short, tell your neighbor, life is short. Life is short. So really folks, life is short, I've learned that. We're all gonna die at some point in time, and hopefully, those who are walking with Christ, you will be walking into eternity. Life is short, eternity is real, but people matter most. So in these end times, these last days, are we in them? Yes, we are. But remember that everything since the, coming, the first coming of Jesus, where he walked fully man, fully God on earth as Jesus the Messiah, until the second coming of Jesus, Jesus himself calls these the last days. Oftentimes we call it end times. Look at Hebrews 1 for a moment, 1 verse 1. The Word of God says, God at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the prophets, to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He's appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds. Look at this for a moment. He says, these last days. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, these last days. So even the author of Hebrews was calling it the last days. In Acts chapter two, 
with the formation of the church, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Peter stands up to speak and he says, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes Joel chapter two. He says in verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Tell your neighbor the last days. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. I have a question for you. Are you young or you're old? Are you getting visions or dreams? <laughs> I've noticed I'm getting more dreams lately. <laughs> but the emphasis here is the last days. You see, Jesus himself calls from the first coming of Jesus to the second coming, the last days. So are we in the last days? Yes. In Matthew 24, verse 8, the scripture says, but all this is only the first of the birth pains. All these last days are the first of the birth pains. I want you to think about that for a moment. Birth pains with more to come. Birth pains. What was Jesus saying? Why, why is the last days birth pains? Why, why is there more tr travail? Why is there greater pain? Surely birth pains give birth to something. Birth pains you have giving birth. And what is the birth pains about? It's about birth pains to focus on Jesus because of the second coming of Jesus, where we need to recognize that there is the second coming of Jesus, where the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, fills the earth, that we have a new heaven and a new earth, and that we walk into a time of walking with the Lord. So we see in Matthew 28, which is after Matthew 24. You see, my math is good, isn't it? Matthew 24 first, a little later, is Matthew 28. Matthew 24 is talking about last days, end times. Matthew 28, Jesus is now speaking. After Matthew 24, he says to the church, he says, do not be afraid. Fear not. Fear not. He says, then he says, now he talks about what we have to do in the last days. Ask your neighbor, are you listening? So if you're online, are you listening? Therefore, go and make disciples of the nations. It doesn't say, therefore, go and buy a piece of land, dig a hole and buy a lot of toilet paper, hide underground with canned food and stay there because you should be afraid. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to command to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. Now, I love this part. Be sure of this. Um, you know, the Irish often say, be sure, be sure, to be sure, to be sure. And, and the Lord stops and he says, be sure of this. He says, be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So even if we're in the last days, be sure of this. I'm with you. And he's calling the church to focus on Jesus and the second coming of Jesus, to focus on what the Holy Spirit is doing, to share with people what God is doing. So regardless of what you see, regardless of what you hear, regardless of what you feel, know this, Jesus is with you until the end of the age. Know this, Jesus wins. He wears the victor's crown. Jesus wins. So the question is, where is your focus? Is it on your dreams? Is it on your hopes? Is it on your bank account? Is it on your ambitions? Or is it on Jesus? Because the book of Revelation, not Revelations, the book of Revelation, one Revelation, is the revealing of Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. Revelation means the unveiling, the revealing of what the heavenly and divine authorities are doing. It's the disclosure or unveiling of heavenly or future realities. It's the revealing of Jesus. Jesus is the main character of the book of Revelation, not the Antichrist, Jesus. So the problem and the concern I have is many people will focus on the Antichrist, the demon of demons. And the problem is that when you focus on the Antichrist instead of Jesus the Christ, You've got to remember that Antichrist is a liar. He's deceptive. 
And what he tries to do is he tries to distract in order to discourage, in order to divide, in order to bring doubt so that any man who's, who doubts, James says, don't think he'll receive anything. And so the devil who's a liar, he's the father of lies, will want you to look at people and see, hey, there's the Antichrist spirit is on him. Hey, and that business over there has got the Antichrist spirit on that business. And that world leader has got the Antichrist on that world leader. And, and so what happens is the focus is on what the devil is doing rather on what Jesus the Christ is doing. This morning, focus on Jesus, please. Focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Because what actually God promises in the new heaven, new earth, where God comes with the second coming of Jesus, he says this in Revelation 21 verse 4. He says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow. No more crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. He makes all things new. We're going to get new bodies. Uh, we're going to give you a new spirit. And God is going to bless us as we walk with him. Then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write these words because who are true and faithful. God is truth and God is faithful. So let's go back a minute and just think for a moment, please. Whilst... Uh, Movies and, and sometimes teachings make us afraid and there's reason for us to be concerned. I want to remind you, do you know that you were formed by God for such a time as this? Do you know you're not an accident? You're not a mistake? God knew you in your mother's womb. He formed you in your mother's womb for this time and for this age. And he's promised you that he will be here with you until the end of the age. Jesus has said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I want to remind you that Micah prophesies that in the last days, the church, the true church, the remnant church of God will become glorious. Micah prophesies that in Micah 4. He also prophesies in the book of Isaiah that the church will grow from glory to glory, from strength to strength. I want to remind you also of the word that says, where sin abounds, grace even more. Tell your neighbor, even more grace. So as we go into these last times, there will be even more grace. Romans 11 prophesies that there's going to be this huge revival and transformation as Israel receives the coming king, the Messiah. There's going to be a revival in Israel. Let me say it again. You were born for such a time as this. Can I ask you to speak over your neighbor as a minister of the gospel and say, you were born for such a time as this. And then let me remind you, you need to be about your father's business. In these days, you need to be allowed about your father's business. So where's your focus now? Is it on the Antichrist or on Jesus Christ? The question you might ask me is, are the signs of the last days here? The answer is yes. So be aware the signs are here that we are in the last days. If you go to Mark 13, you'll see in verse 1 and 2, Jesus and the disciples are looking at these amazing buildings of the temple down in Jerusalem. They're in Judea looking at the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, the disciples are talking about how beautiful the buildings are. In today's terms, the buildings were worth over a billion dollars in terms of how it looked and the investment into it. A billion dollars. A billion dollar building. And as they looked at these buildings, they were saying how magnificent these buildings are. And uh, then Jesus says, yes, they are. In verse 2, he says, but they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another Another. As he says that, the disciples are confused. Why would they be demolished? You see, this that Jesus is talking about is a prophecy, a multidimensional prophecy, but it's a prophecy of what would happen in their generation, and it did. It happened in AD 67 when the Roman general Titus uh, surrounded Jerusalem and cut off the supplies and then went into Jerusalem and burned down the temple, removing every stone, tearing out the gold, removing every stone. And in that time, 1.1 million Jewish people died from that attack. 
famine, disease, sickness, and being killed. 70,000 Jewish people were taken as slaves and dispersed to the four corners of the globe. Has this sign happened? Yes, in AD 67 to AD 70. So are the signs of these times being the last days here? Absolutely, yes. In verse four, the disciples respond and say, tell us when will all this happen? What sign shall follow us that these things are about to be fulfilled? And so the Jewish people were very familiar with signs. They were familiar with signs because, for example, uh, when Jesus was born, the, the moon and the stars and the planets lined up and three magi saw the sign. Tell your neighbor the sign. They saw the sign in the heavens and they followed the sign all the way to Bethlehem to the home of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. Three magi followed the signs. The whole world knew about the signs. The known Hebrew world knew about the signs, but only three people followed the signs. And that should concern us because many of us are not aware of the signs, yet God gives us the signs. In Genesis 1.14, just wanted to show you the scripture, God himself speaks and God says, let there be light bearers, being the sun, moon, and stars, at the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be useful for signs, signs, a signal of God's provident care and for the marking of seasons, days, and years. I I share that with you because here God says he's going to use the moon and the stars and the sun as signs, a signal to the world, not just seasons separating between summer, autumn, winter, spring, but also seasons. And the word seasons there actually means a feast, a coming together of people who gather together. And there will be signs. Joel talks about in chapter two that the signs in the heavens, the the moon will turn blood red. And there've been four significant blood red moons. So the signs have been given. And let me give you some other signs from prophecy. First, the word of God says, that the last days really begins, heats up, starts to increase when Israel, who's been dispersed to the four corners of the earth, the Hebrews are brought back into Jerusalem. And when they are moved back into Jerusalem and take over Jerusalem as the capital, that generation will start to see the last days. That happened for the first time in May 14, 1948. Jerusalem underneath the Jewish rule happened in 1967. So those of you who were born around that time, in that generation, we start to see the signs ratchet up of last days. And with that is a sign of growing anti-Semitism across the world, which we are seeing right now. Then there's the Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 signs. There's also the second Thessalonians chapter two, verse seven to 10, signs of the lawless one coming and a great falling away in the church, a great falling away in the church. Listen to me again, a great falling away in the church. Where within the church, many people who've been following Jesus and in fellowship with one another start to separate because they love sin. They're offended and they become judgmental and legalistic. They fall into sin judging people or fall into sin by being unrepentant, unforgiving, and they step away from fellowship. It's called the apostasy, the great apostasy, the great falling away. But for us, first, focus on Jesus. In second, do not be deceived. In Mark 13, verse 6, the scripture says, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name. Say with me, many. Many will come in my name. They'll come as teachers. They'll come claiming that they're anointed. They come claiming they've got a special revelation. Many will come in my name, deceiving many. False teachers, false prophets will increase. I think we're seeing that. You'll hear of wars and threats of wars, rumors of wars. Now look at this. But don't panic. Tell your neighbor, don't panic. He says, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. 
Yes, nation will rise against nation. Kingdom will rise against kingdom. There'll be earthquakes in many parts of the world as well as famines. But this is only the beginning of the first of the birth pains with more to come. Now, verse 10 says, and this is where you and I step in, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Do you know you're a minister of the gospel of Jesus the Christ? And he calls you to minister his gospel. In uh, Mark 13 verse 5, the scripture says, don't let anyone mislead you. Jesus is speaking. So in this time, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah. Now the word Messiah, Christ, means the anointed one. Many will come and say, I'm anointed. You need to come to my church to receive healing and you need to pay me. And uh, you need to pay me for prophecy and you need to pay me for this and, and you need to give me your car because you know, your car, we're in last days. So you need to give me your car. You need to give me your land because we're in the last days. What do you need it for? It's the last days. Give me, give me, give me, give me. Give it, give it because you're giving it to God. Can I tell you something? Everything you have is God's. You're not to give anything except that which God tells you to give. Amen. You are a steward of the Lord's resources. The body you have is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Steward it for God. The finances, the clothes, your life, your vision, it's God's. Realign it to the Lord. Don't be deceived. Tell your neighbor, be alert, don't be deceived. So how do you stop getting deceived? And this is absolutely crucial. Because deception is really an awful thing. I don't know if you realize how awful it is. The problem with deception is you don't know when you're deceived. And uh, so we can be deceived and be, think we are sincere, and we are sincere, but we can be wrong too. You can be sincerely wrong. If you're deceived, you can be sincere, but you can be sincerely wrong. So how do we stop being deceived? And I want to teach you this, please, because there are so many false prophets, so many false teachers, and so many people saying, let's focus on the Antichrist. Let's focus on the devil. Can I ask you to focus on Jesus? The devil's a liar, and he wants to divide you. He wants to distract you. He wants to divide you. He wants to discourage you from fellowshipping. Focus on Jesus. Don't be deceived. Jude addresses how we should have an attitude. If you ever get a chance to spend time over the next three weeks, read Jude. It's only one chapter. It's beautiful. He's talking about the last days and how people will stand up against God's delegated authority and against God's direct authority. He talks about how we'll come into a culture of where people will love money and people will love themselves and people will love sin. People will love bribes and enjoy taking bribes. And people will fall into sexual sin more and more. People's identities will be confused more and more in the last days. And it says they brag loudly about themselves and they flatter others to get what they want. Good morning, sir. How are you, sir? Really, you're you're just after something. So Jude 1 verse 17 says, this is how we should have this attitude in these last days. He says, but you, beloved, tell your neighbor, that's you. Remember the words which were spoken by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember how they told you that in the last days, there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual people who cause division, not having the Holy Spirit. And then he says, but you, beloved. Now he talks three things I'd like you to focus on for the last days. He says, but you beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. That's what we've got to do. In these last days, focus on Jesus and build yourself up on the most holy faith. And you do that by reading the word, by memorizing the scripture, by pressing into a personal relationship with Jesus the Christ, by focusing on what Jesus is saying, by focusing on what God tells you to do, do it. Tell your neighbor what God tells you to do, do it. First, build yourself up in the most holy faith. The second thing he says is pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Holy Spirit. So what that means is going into the presence of God and letting God speak. He is God, we are not. Letting him speak and having heard him speak, speaking what he wants you to speak. 
walking in the walk that he wants you to walk, coming to a place of repentance before the Lord and repentance before man, walking in humility, not pride, praying in the Holy Spirit. It also means praying in tongues, building up the Holy Spirit, the spirit inside of you, the spirit man inside of you by praying in tongues. The third thing he says is keep yourselves in the love of God. This is crucial. Keep yourselves in the love of God because many of us are not keeping ourselves in the love of God. Many of us are stepping out of the love of God and getting offended with one another, getting angry with one another, getting judgmental with one another, criticizing one another. That's not the love of God. The love of God doesn't come into a church building or into a family and look for things that are going wrong. The love of God comes into a church building or into a family and says, Lord, what are you doing? Lord, what are you saying? Because I want to remind you, the scripture tells us all have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all fallen short. So we aren't partnering with what's wrong. We're partnering with what God says is right. And we're building up in the love of God challenging that which is wrong, but walking in the love of God. When you keep yourselves in the love of God, the scripture says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, look at this, unto eternal life. The focus is on Jesus Christ for eternity. Our decisions need to be based on eternity. And then he says in verse 22, and on some have compassion, making a distinction Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments defiled by their flesh. So there's two groups of people. One, that we have to have compassion on. Others, we are to save, hating the garments that are defiled by the flesh. Both groups. In other words, God doesn't give us permission to cut off from anyone. Do you know why? Love never gives up. Love never quits. Love endures all things, believes all things, and hopes all things. God is love, and he calls us that if you've got people who are caught in sin, get on your knees and start praying for them. In Mark 13, verse 9, when these things begin to happen, watch out. You'll be handed over to the local councils and beaten in the synagogues. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, times will get tough. Times will get tough. We don't preach a, a, a soft gospel here. I want you to know the truth. In the last days, times will get tough. But he says, because you are my followers, you'll get beaten up. Now look at this. When you get beaten up, tell your neighbor, when you get beaten. I know you don't like me saying this. I'm sorry, but you will be. The word of God tells us that. But when you get beaten, look at this. This is an opportunity for you to tell them about me. In other words, in this season, we have a window of opportunity. Be ready to share Jesus. Be ready to share Jesus. God wants us to share Jesus even when we're getting beaten up. In this season, we as a church have to become much more quick to share the love of God by the way we work by the way we handle finances, by the way we speak to one another, by the way we share, by the way we eat, by the way we talk. Look for opportunities to share the love of God. Look for opportunities to evangelize. The call of God on us is for us to be about our Father's business. And what's his business? Sharing Jesus. If you're not passionate about sharing Jesus, Something's gone wrong. If you're not in love with God's people, something's gone wrong. If you see someone stuck in sin and you don't care about them, something's gone horribly wrong because that's not the heart of the Father. If you don't want to pray for or serve people, something's gone wrong. You've missed the love of God. And so I want to challenge you this morning. Do you love people? If you don't, you need heart surgery because God wants to fill us with his love that we love others just as he loved us whilst we were yet in our sin. So this is a season and it's a window where we need to get the word of God out 
So as times increase and it gets tougher, share Jesus. And let me share something with you. It's going to get tougher. But where sin abounds, grace even more. And I've started to see in my life more and more miracles. On Thursday, someone contacted me from England to say someone in a drug rehab program had overdosed on heroin, was dying, or was on a ventilator. He said, please, can you pray? I started praying. I called back 10 minutes later. He said, the guy's off the ventilator. He's healed. He's restored. He's sitting up. Amen. I believe that where sin abounds, grace even more. And you'll be able to share Jesus because as you walk into situations, people are anxious, but you've got peace that surpasses understanding. People are worried, but you have the peace of God. In Mark 13, verse 13, he says, you will be hated for my all, you'll all be hated for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. I think the church needs to recognize that we need to be prepared to endure. It's not about a, a comfortable doctrine or a comfortable season. Get ready to endure. You're called to be the soldier of Jesus Christ. You're called to put the armor of God on. You're called to walk in obedience to him. Perseverance is needed. The church needs to learn how to endure, how to pace itself after the pacemaker, Jesus, following Jesus. The church needs to get ready for the possibility of persecution for paying the price of being a follower of Jesus Christ. We have become too soft. Let me say that again. We've become too soft, living for ourselves, for our bank account, for our house, for our car. It's all about me, Jesus. And God is bringing correction. Birth pains are beginning. Tell your neighbor, birth pains begin. So I wanted to challenge you this morning. It's time to learn how to endure. We are headed into a season where the world is going to be more narcissistic, more hedonistic. We're heading into a season where God calls us to be his hands and feet. We serve Jesus by serving others. And so can I invite the worship team up? And as they do, can I ask you to consider this? How do we overcome in this season? Remember next week, we're talking about the Antichrist spirit. And the week after that, the end and the beginning. I know that there'll be more questions now caused from this than answers, so please forgive me. I can't do justice to this topic in six or seven sessions even, but I believe God is saying this season, can you tell your neighbor, fear not, focus on Jesus. And I'm, I'm here to say to you, be aware, the signs are here, but be alert, don't be deceived. Be ready to share Jesus. Be prepared to endure. You know why? God is with you until the end of the time. Can I ask you to stand this morning as the worship team comes up? And I'm going to do something this morning that I feel like is really important. Sometimes people ask, why do I keep asking people to say things to their neighbor? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And God created you. Can I ask you to tell your neighbor, you were created for such a time as this. You're chosen by God for now. You are blessed. You are his. He has anointed you. He is with you till the end of the age. Amen. This morning, just listen to Jude chapter 1 verse 24, because Jude's talking about end times. And he says to you, at this time, whilst everything's shaking, he says this. Now to him, he's talking about God, who's able to keep you from stumbling. Do you know in this age, God can keep you from stumbling. And he's able to present you faultless. Even if you've made mistakes, guess what? He can present you faultless. Not only that, he does that with exceeding joy. God loves to present you faultless. My son, my daughter, I'm going to present you faultless. He loves to do that. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore, in Jesus' name. Church, do not fear. God is with you. You were made for this time. You were made to shine as God's hands and feet. Can I ask you just to close your eyes for a moment? Lord, I come against the spirit of fear and anxiety around this topic. And I thank you, Father, that you are present. You are here now. For those of you with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, 
If you recognize you've been anxious and you realize your focus has been on demons or antichrist instead of Christ, this morning, just let's go into a time of forgiveness. Father, we ask you for forgiveness, for focusing on the, the things that are happening in the world rather than what you're doing. This morning, help us to realign, to come underneath your grace. Help us to focus on you and what you're doing. Lord, help us to recognize the signs are here. Help us to walk in your word and not be deceived. Help us to be prepared, be ready to share you, and help us to get ready to endure in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I command the spirit of anxiety to leave. And Lord, I bless your church this morning, that your church now receive understanding and revelation that you are with them, that you are for them, where sin abounds grace even more, that you will empower, that you will equip, that you will lift. And so, Father, help us now to rest on your shoulders, that whilst darkness might be to the left, as in the graphic, and to the right, we know that you're with us. We see the light. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. And Father, I thank you that you anoint us to walk through this time in your grace. And everyone who agrees with that says, Amen. In Jesus' name.